Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the ISM New Jersey webinar series. Today's event is going to be on enhanced skills for every work environment. At this time, I would like to let everybody know you can use, if you have a question for a speaker for today, you can use the, uh, the Q&A tab or the chat function and insert your question there. And at some point in the program, either during the program or after uh, the presentation, our speaker will be answering those questions. Um, I'd also like to do a nice welcome to all of our chapters from all over the US that are joining us today, including Dallas, Denver, Nevada, Eastern Virginia, Charlotte, and of course, uh, all those members from the New York and New Jersey area. At this point, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Jane Tierney. Jane founded Purple Inc. Link in 2015 recognizing there's a better way to attain value, achieve results. Clients discover innovative ways to identify waste and risk leaking dollars from the supply chain, draining the bottom line by collaborating with stakeholders and suppliers using purple link skill tools and processes. Clients reduce cost and risk while sustaining successes year over year. After earning a degree in industrial engineering from the University of Missouri, Jane obtained her MBA from San Diego State. Passionate about Lean Six Sigma, she holds a green belt certification from the University of Michigan and earns her CPSM and also her CPSD accreditation from the Institute for Supply Management. Jane has been a past speaker and I would like to now turn the program over to Jane. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you, all of the attendees. Uh, I, I love these Zoom virtual meetings because Kathy just listed all of these different cities and all these different areas, and I think it's great that we can get so many people together uh, for a quick little session, and then everybody goes back to their life. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here. This is a, a topic that's really hot for everyone. So we're going to talk about um, some skills and what to do, how you can build skills. I want to ask three questions um, first, and the first one, you can answer these or yourself, or if you want to put answers in the chat, if you want to answer in the chat, what I would ask you to do is put the numbers of the um, questions that you answer yes to. So you don't have to put uh, anything, just put like, if you answer yes to all three, then just write the numbers one, two, three in there. So the first question I'm going to ask is, do you have the skills to boost your company through recovery and beyond? Are you confident that you know and you have your company has skills to get it through recovery and beyond? The second question is, do you have the skills um, across the team that you're on to propel the company through recovery and beyond? So do you have them personally is number one, and then do you have them in your team number two? And then the final question is, is your management confidence that the needed skills to drive these changes and drive through recovery and beyond are available in there? So do you have the skills? Do, does your team have the skills? And then does your management think that you have what you need in order to go forward? So if you want to put some numbers in the chat, that would help give me a little feedback. Since it's hard for me to see people. Okay, I guess if you don't want to participate, that's okay. Um, but a lot of people don't have the skills and a lot of managers know that they don't have the complete uh, portfolio of skills in their team. So we're gonna talk about what you can do about that today. There we go. Um, there's somebody who volunteered. Thank you. Um, so we're gonna talk about some of the factors that are driving the environment for needing more skills. Um, we're going to talk about some managerial insights from some studies that were done that say these are the supply chain skills that they need in their organizations. Then I'm going to talk about some skills in terms of categories, what might be needed now and what's in the future. We'll look at doing a gap analysis and then um, how we can close those gaps. And then I'm going to do a little raffle and we'll give away some prizes. So we have a lot to cover today, but I want to make sure I that uh, that we stay connected and that I give away the prizes at the end. So right now, if you want to participate in the raffle, 
you need to send me, I know your phone's right there next to you, send me a, uh, an email to jane at purplelink.co and just put webinar in the subject line. So there's no M on that. It's not .com. Somebody already had that taken, of course. But jane at purplelink.co subject line webinar, and then you'll get into the prize drawing. So you can do that. And if you're not quite ready to do that, I'll give you another chance at the end before I actually make the drawing. So you can hang on. So there's some common questions and I really love this um, because I've had this conversation myself when I was in corporate America. What happens if we invest in developing these people and then they turn around and leave? And they, the obvious response is, is to ask a, answer a question with another question. What happens if we don't make that investment and they stay? So this is the one where I always use this argument when I was trying to get budget for my department to say, hey, we need to do some things. We need to go to some webinars. We need to go to some conferences. We need to go to some seminars and get some people some exposure, some additional skills to up their skills. When I was in corporate America, my senior people had a requirement every year to take some kind of class, external class, um, one day, two day kind of thing. And they could pick, I would send them wherever they wanted to go, but they needed to take that course. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But I think it's important that as managers that we do that, but as an individual, you have that responsibility too. So before we talk a lot about solutions, I wanna talk about the environment that we find ourselves in because that impacts what we do, our focus, and the skills that we need. Boy, things have changed in the last year, right? We've had this pandemic that we've been dealing with, a lot of things that we never thought were possible, like a lot of supply chain people working from home, because many years they, they said, and I have to admit, I said it, if you support production, you got to be here. You can't be working from home remotely. Now, I did that as a manager. I worked remotely part-time when I had to make travel and do some different things. But for the most part, we were in the office. Um, and you know what? It's working. Most companies are finding that it's working and it's working well. So some of those things that we were doing prior to in, you know, the, the start of the pandemic a year ago, we're, we're still doing um, and, and we're doing them in different ways. And what we found though, through all of this is that companies are still pushing for assurance of supply. They're still pushing for cost reductions. They're still pushing for lots of different initiatives that we need to be supporting. So it's not all about getting the parts in, although that's as critical as it's ever been, but we find that we're in the mil middle of talent wars. Um, they've been going on for a while, and I think the pandemic actually highlighted that. Companies are looking for skill sets, they're looking for knowledge, they're looking for capability, and what we're finding is that now more than ever, transparency in the supply chain is really critical. You have to understand not only your suppliers, but their suppliers and sometimes their supplier suppliers, so that tier two and three is becoming more important. We've seen lots of examples of this issue from the pandemic, but even before that, people placed orders for items and didn't realize the amount of parts that came from somewhere else from the supplier than from the supplier they were buying from, uh, in particular China. I know at the beginning of the pandemic, I talked to a couple of colleagues uh, in a council that I belong to, and they said, we're not too worried because we don't buy a lot from China. This is when we thought China was going to be the biggest hotspot in the world, and it was going to be a, a problem there. They said, we don't buy much from China. And um, so, we, you know, we think we're okay. We've got some inventory. We think it's going to be fine. And I talked to them a couple months later, and they said, you know what? It wasn't fine. We found out that we didn't buy a lot from China, but boy, the people we bought from bought a lot from China. And there's a there's a lot going on and a lot that we weren't aware of. So now they're trying to be more and more aware of that. Um, it's changed the way a lot of companies do business. And then we find that there's regulatory requirements and regulatory requirements continue to to grow, to increase, get broader, deeper. They they're they're just coming from everywhere. Customers are asking suppliers when they can, you know, conf conflict minerals. Where did you get this? Where did you get that? 
So there's a lot of different things in there. And, and where are your suppliers and where are they located? It used to be just, do they have parts? Now it's where are they located? What are they doing about making sure they have the assurance of supply? All of these things have an impact on our business. And a lot of companies are saying, do we really have the knowledge and the skills to deal with all of these things? Not only now getting still through the pandemic, which is amazing that it's a year and we're still in that pandemic mode, but once, once we do get past this and we're seeing light at the end of the tunnel, which is great. So this is a set of skills that I've used for a long time. I, I use these five categories of skills with my clients. Uh, I use these when I was a corporate manager. And I said, these are the skills that you need in supply chain. Um, they're valued by the whole organization. The first of these is procurement. So that's, if you're gonna be in supply chain, you need to understand some basics about procurement. If you're gonna be a buyer, you really need to understand how you're gonna acquire goods and services. But you also need that if you're in, um, in production, you need to understand about that procurement process. If you're in logistics, any of those things, you need to understand about that, how goods and services are acquired and managed and things. Operations is an important one. Um, you need to understand something about the planning processes, the production processes, um, the customers. Uh, you, you need to understand about the customer service and things like that. You need to understand about business acumen. More and more companies are asking their supply chain people, can you do a return on investment of this? One of the biggest things that uh, has been in recent years is inventory turns or inventory turnover. They ask supply chain people to calculate that, to monitor the inventory turns, and to be able to report that out. If you don't understand some basic finance, that how you calculate inventory turns, which is based on your cost of goods sold and your average inventory balances, then and sometimes it's it's against your revenues, so rather than your cost of goods sold. But however you calculate that, you need to understand what your company's doing and what they're doing with that. You need to have some quality and lean Six Sigma kinds of skills. You need to have some um, ability to do financial analysis. So there's a lot of things in that area you need. You need to have teamwork, be able to work with others. I always said as a manager that uh, we needed that box that you have like in grade school where it says works well with others and you get a check mark if you're not doing so well. I've had some people on my staff that got check marks and um, I didn't really like to do that, but that's what you need to be able to work with others. Doesn't matter if you're great, if you're not getting along with your teammates and your stakeholders, it's not important. But teamwork in supply chain is more than just that. It's really about being able to collaborate with stakeholders. And that includes suppliers and supplier suppliers. It includes today being ethical, um, diversity, being socially correct and understanding social responsibility aspects. So it's being able to work in the environment that is presented by your company, by your suppliers, by the society that we live in. And then there are strategic or big picture thinking skills, the grasping of, of context of things. So not only is it important here, but here's how it's important to the business, being proactive and things like that. So these skills are pretty important. I've used them for a long time. And I found this study that it was done in the very end of 2019. It was done by the American Productivity and Quality Center, APQC. And what they did is they asked supply chain managers across the country uh, and across a wide range of industries, they asked them to tell us the important, what are the top 10 skills? What are the skills that you want people to have? Um, I added that third column there because the first two columns are strictly from that survey. I added the third column to say, hey, these are, these are the things I've been saying too. Um, what I didn't see in there, again, this, these were supply chain managers. What I didn't see was a lot of the operational skills, but we'll talk a little bit more about those and why I think those are so important. Um, it's interesting that you know the top two skills here, business ethics and communication, I put those kind of in the business acumen area. Um, business ethics is also a teamwork kind of thing, but it's also no, and it's strategic, knowing what is ethical, what is not, how to be able to kind of skate that. Communication skills, both oral and written, a huge, huge requirement. Excuse me. 
Stakeholder management, again, this, this has to do with working with people and doing things um, interactively, collaboratively. Again, relationship building. So stake, stakeholder management, relationship building, um, and supplier relationship management are three of the top 10. I think that's fascinating. Um, I happen to agree with it, but I think it's really interesting that they highlighted three of those separately and put all three in the top 10. The core procurement skills, again, these are supply chain managers, but two of these are really procurement related. That's the supplier relationship management and that's the traditional negotiation. So that tells me that executives value employees who can build mutual trust with their suppliers and they recognize that suppliers are really an extension of the company's operational function. I've known several individuals who built a reputation on being a tough negotiator and they were good at squeezing suppliers and forcefully getting to a target price. And that's a skill that's still valuable, but it's really important too that you understand that a lot of these suppliers, when they come back, if you squeeze them and got that last dime out of them, they're not going to be happy when they come back the next year or two years later to renegotiate. So you want to make sure that you balance that with this relationship building. And four of these skills here that they rank as top 10, I associate with teamwork. That includes stakeholder management, uh, relationship building, the leadership part, and being a team player. So it's interesting that they put leadership in there. I put that in as a teamwork skill because you have to know who's on your team and who's following you and who's not who's with you and who's supporting you. And um, leadership comes in lots of forms. It can be from those who have leadership positions or managerial titles, but a lot of the leaders in organizations don't necessarily have those titles or they may not hold that title within their, er their area of leadership. So you might be able to be a very strong leader over and above the area that you manage. And I think that's important. So you need to know how to lead, when to lead, how to guide, when to remain silent sometimes. And then two skills are strategic. And these are really the hardest, I think, to learn. They're hard to teach. They're hard to acquire. They're hard to define. And, and those two in this list happen to be critical thinking and comp complex decision making. Um, so today, after we've been through 12 plus months of the pandemic, I wouldn't be surprised to see something like risk-based decision-making in there uh, instead of, or maybe alongside complex decision-making because risk has been such a huge topic for so many people for the last year. And as I stated, this study took a look at these top 10 most important skills, but then they asked the participants to share their perception of the effectiveness of the training and developing people in their organization with each of these top 10 skills. So what they found is double digit gaps with all 10 of these skills. The largest gap was in communications. So you can see the long dark line is what they said, this is an importance. So they're in order of importance, just like I showed you with business ethics, communication and whatever. And then the small shorter blue line is where they felt the effectiveness of training that their people were getting was. So if you look at communications, which is that biggest gap, um, communications, 55.9% of the people said this is one of the top 10 skills, and yet they felt that the effectiveness in developing that was only at about 20% of where it needed to be. So it's, there's significant gaps in all 10 of these skills. And that's a little scary because they're very clear about what they think is important, but all of these have huge gaps. So we're gonna talk about these skills and I'm gonna look at these different categories of my skills in a little more detail, just to give you kind of a quick overview of what else is in there besides those top couple of things. Procurement skills, especially for ISM and because a lot of us are in that procurement purchasing area. Procurement skills are the ones that help you acquire goods and services. They're the ones companies need to manage their suppliers. There's a lot of soft skills in this category. Sorry. Things like collaboration and supplier relationship management. So there's hard skills and there's soft skills. And you actually, to be successful, you need a blend of both. 
So you want to have all, you know, some of all of these things. And you'll see soft skills actually in all five of these categories. But things like MRP competence, that's, that's a harder skill. Um, inventory management, that's a hard skill. Um, spend analysis, another kind of business acumen related type of thing, but it's, it's, those are hard skills. But there's other areas that you need. Market research is important. Being able to negotiate, but also being able to collaborate is important. Um, understanding supplier performance, being able to assess risk, relationship management, being able to monitor and have a little bit of understanding about performance in terms of cost and quality, uh, business fit, responsiveness, as well as delivery. And then operations. So operations is another area. This is uh, it's especially true for manufacturing, any kind of manufacturing, but even if you're in a services business, you want, need to understand the operations of your business. If you're in services, you need to know about those services. How are they performed? Who does the performing of those? How are they put together? What's the intention of those services? Um, I put skills in here like blueprint reading. I think that's an important skill if you have any kind of manufacturing environment, but if not, you have things like forecasting. So whether you're, you're manufacturing or service oriented, you still need to understand forecasts. You need to be able to put forecasts together um, from the forecast that your company is projecting for their own production. And then you need to be able to forecast to your suppliers and let them know what you expect to need from them in the next quarter, the next two quarters, maybe the next year, year and a half, couple of years. So forecasting is a, an important skill. Uh, sales and operation planning, a lot of people don't understand this. This is a very important part of running a business and procurement figures really heavily in that, but that's an operational skill that includes forecasting, demand management, and some other things, very important. Today, I think it's important that you have some understanding of Lean and Six Sigma just in time um, and quality. Overall, being able to do some analytics around that are important. Business acumen is another one. Uh, I talked a little bit about this, but if you can read balance sheets for your suppliers, if you can do a cash flow analysis, that helps. If you can calculate payback periods and return on investment. Um, if you understand what goes into COGS, understand a little bit about the overheads and what, what overheads your company uses to, to figure out the total cost. Um, it's important to have those skills, have that knowledge, be able to get that. And it's important to be able to talk to suppliers um, in a knowledgeable way about those same aspects. You can need to know how to talk to suppliers about things associated with their risk. I know one of the things is with small businesses, if they're publicly held, you need to, you can go to the website and get their balance sheets and their, their annual reports, their quarterly reports, and, and you can read that. If it's a privately held business, you can't get that. And a lot of times we've been stymied because, oh, we asked for some financial data, but they don't want to give us anything. They don't want to give us their revenue. They don't want to give us their um, sales. They don't want to give us their employment levels. Okay, then ask for other things. You can ask for some ratios, like a debt to equity ratio. And you can give them a list of things, ask their accountant to give it to you. So then if you have a debt to equity ratio, you understand, do they have a lot of debt compared to the equity they have? You may not have any idea how big the equity is or how small, but you want you understand the ratio of debt to that. You can look for things like, okay, baseline, and I'm working with the client now, I said baseline 2018, go back that far. 18, 2018 is the baseline. Then say, how did your sales and revenue change from 2018 to 2019, 2019 to 2020? And then what's your projection going from 2020 to 2021? So you can see, are there ups and downs in there? Are there big swings? You don't need to know what the revenue is, but what you want to know is, are they growing? Are they shrinking? What is that? You can do the same thing with employment levels. You can talk about attrition rates. Uh, they may not want to tell you if they're a small business and maybe they only have 100 people. They don't want to tell you how many they lost, but you can say, okay, what's your attrition rate? How many people do you lose over the course of a year? One or two people over the course of the year, 1% may not be too bad. Um, on the other hand, you want to know if they've taken action to have to reduce their workforce. Uh, 
or to increase their workforce. So I ask questions like, have you increased your workforce more than 10% over the last 12 to 18 months? Have you reduced your workforce more than 10, 10% or more over the last 12 to 18 months, or maybe six to 12 months? Whatever you think is relevant to understand, ask some questions that they will give you. And this is good financial information to be able to interpolate and extrapolate and use. So uh, beyond that, you should have some Microsoft skills. One of my pet peeves is email etiquette. And I think they should teach college classes in nothing but email etiquette. Spelling, grammar, communication, again, that, co that comes into his. Those are all important. Uh, proficiency in Excel, I think, is more important than ever because we have so much data. We're always trying to get information from that. So you need to know how to manipulate that. You need to know how to do things like put formulas into Excel, do sorting, filtering, create some pivot tables, charts, a few things like that. Again, um, communication goes to things like not only Word and email, but PowerPoint. Can you create a presentation? Can you deliver it with confidence and get people to listen to your message? So things are important there. And supply chain professionals have to know about things like ethics, social responsibility, sustainability. All those things are very important. You need to know your own values and convictions, and you may need to make sure that they're aligned with your employer, at, or at least they're not at odds with your employer. And then you need to be working with your suppliers to make sure that their values and convictions align with your companies. If you get too far out of alignment there, you can have some problems. I spent the first part of my career working as a manufacturing engineer, and I really value workplace safety. Um, something that other people may take for granted, but I worked with a lot of suppliers and then I had the opportunity to work with suppliers all over the globe and working with non-US suppliers who don't have to answer to OSHA regulations and things like that, it was an area that I stressed. So for me, that was an important area. E each people, every person may have their own kind of hot button issues, but it's important to, to know those and to make sure that you share those. And with everybody having different aspects, then it's a really good uh, sum of what you come up with when you're asking questions. You need to know how to lay out process flows. You need to be able to read a flow chart and do things. You need to be able to assess risk. Risk is everywhere, so you need to be aware of what types of risk can come in, consider both the possibility of, of occurrence, what's the probability that something's going to happen, and then if it does happen, what's the impact, so that you can try to mitigate that, eliminate the risk, or either eliminate the probability or the impact, or both if you can. And then you really need to be comfortable in your MRP system. You need to be able to get information out of there, not just data, and you need to make sure that you're using that for measuring things like supplier performance. Teamwork, you know, we, we start with teamwork when we get signed up for Little League Baseball or soccer or whatever you're, you do at, as a youngster. And maybe some of those things stick and maybe they don't, but you end up working on teams uh, in, in school and all through college. Every class I teach, we have team projects. And most of my students tell me that all of their professors do that. I think it's just a professor thing because that way you don't have to grade as many papers, but that may be just my own personal bias. But I, I also do that because you have to work with teams in business and it, it's not always people that you would choose to work with very closely. It's not always a team that you get to choose to be on. Sometimes you get drafted, sometimes you get assigned, and it, but it's important that you're able to deliver results. So uh, this category is almost exclusively these soft skills. They're not, again, easy to define. It's not always easy to teach this, but this is an area, teamwork, if there are gaps here, it's one of the first things that gets noticed. And it gets noticed by managers, by peers, by stakeholders, both internal and external. So if someone doesn't have good teaming skills, then it, it's very apparent. So you can assess yourself and you can also look at members of your team and see who really is good at these things. So it's an active listening kind of thing. It's who's cooperative and co coordinating and chipping in, <coughs> excuse me, what are the team roles, formal and informal, and who takes what uh, role in that department. 
who are the natural leaders, who are the people who are managing things and managing the parts of the organization, even if they're not officially entitled as a manager, but they still are able to manage projects and manage the work and help get things done. Um, advocating diversity and inclusion is an important part of teamwork right now. Respect, respecting hierarchies, traditions, and also being able to manage your stakeholders. That means internal and external. So very important to have a lot of those types of skills. Um, and then finally, strategic. As I said, this is really difficult to define and it's even more difficult to develop in individuals. But these skills are often critical for career development and advancement. So you're looking beyond converting requisitions to purchase orders. There are skills that you need for dealing with the challenges, not only from the pandemic, but from every other, um, oh crap, that happens in your business. Um, that these include creativity and innovation. Um, again, hard to measure, hard to define, hard to assess. Is this person really creative or do, are they innovative or are they just following uh, the lead somewhere else? But coming up with new ways to solve problems and new and different ways to solve problems is really a skill. You can learn that and it can be honed. Like many other skills, these things can, can be innate, but whatever, Aptitude you have naturally, you can hone all of these skills. Using good judgment, being able to be flexible, being able to be responsive, respond quickly and completely. If you can do these things, then that's gonna actually move your career forward more quickly. So we've talked about the skills and there's so many, but once you understand the skills, it, the thing you wanna do now is to identify the gaps. I, I want to emphasize that the skills that are needed now in the workplace, these were needed pre-COVID. Companies haven't changed um, in huge magnitude of what they need. And the project, ones we're projecting to need in the next few years, they're the same ones. They're, these skills um, are, are, are things that companies need. A lot of people feel like they lost a year in their skill development or their career development to COVID, but that was a time, and it's still a good time, to try to assess your skills and try to build those out. So defining these gaps is the next step, and it's very important. You need to be really honest about where the gaps are. If you're a manager, you want to be honest with yourself about your team. You want to be candid. You want to be almost harsh in your honesty and saying, where, am, where is my team good and where is it not so good? Not, and you want to do that with yourself too. This is not a sadistic or masochistic exercise to say who, who is the weak link, um, who gets voted off the island, but you're really trying to say, okay, we need improvements and what are the things that we need more of? What are the gaps that we have where we don't have any of those kinds of skills? Because this is where you start to put these skills into a priority list and you say, how am I gonna get those? There's a lot of ways to get those and we'll talk about some of those in the next couple of slides, but you can borrow them, you can train them in, you can you know, get them from different things. But what you wanna do is to understand the big gaps because that's what you're trying to fill you're, or the, that's the gap that you're trying to close. So when you are able to hire somebody, then that's the skills that you should look for and you should prioritize those in your new candidate. You shouldn't just find a candidate, oh, this person is great, they can do these things. If you already have good strength on your team in certain areas, don't keep hiring this people with the same skills hire some people with some complementary skills, some different skills to build up the strength of the entire team. So closing these gaps is a challenge. And we're gonna look at this from three perspectives. I look at this as if you're an individual and you want to improve, maybe get a, a, a better job, maybe get a promotion, maybe go somewhere else and, and get um, a, a movement upward. If you want to move up and move on, that's good. So I'm going to talk about things you can do as an individual. 
I'm going to talk about things you can do as a manager that recognizes that your staff isn't as strong as it could be or should be or needs to be to keep going and to keep helping your entire company. And I'm going to talk about it as a company perspective. Where are your goals? Where are the improvement areas? Um, where are you not hitting the things that you want to hit? What are the objectives and the results that you're not getting and that you would like to see? Or if you don't have a big budget for a lot of major initiatives, sometimes it doesn't take a big budget. And I'm going to talk about what I call a shoestring method, very inexpensive ways to do this. What we do find is that a lot of traditional methods aren't working. Um, companies are not being able to spend a lot of money on a lot of different options, um, but you still need to move forward. And now we have the added challenge of people working remotely. We're gonna have hybrid workplaces for the next probably foreseeable future. Many companies are playing around with what they can do besides demanding that everybody comes back to work and is still back there from seven to 3.30 like they were before or from eight to 4.30, whatever your schedule was. They're, they're saying, what can we do differently? How can we get people back when we need them in the offices we need them in and yet give them the flexibility and utilize the productivity gains that we have gained in the last few months and also not put our people at risk for people who don't are still trying to social distance and still trying to manage with the protocols given and they're in different in different areas too so that companies that have multiple locations they may have a set of rules in California that don't apply to the rules in Texas that don't apply to the rules in, in the Chicago area or Seattle or whatever. So you have to be flexible and looking at this and companies are struggling with that. So they don't have a lot of budgets. They don't have a lot of um, traditional ways to do their skill enhancement. So let's look at what you can do. Because what you're trying to do is to increase the knowledge, increase the skills and the capabilities not only of the organization, and but the individuals. I mean, not only of the individuals, but the entire organization. You want that synergy thing going on. Um, the simple model on the right-hand side here is a good one. You need to say, where am I, the current state? Where do I wanna be? What's my future state? What are my gaps? And then how am I gonna go fix that? So whether you're looking at it from the organizational standpoint, the managerial or the individual, look and find out what the gaps are. What, is, what are the gaps? What is the future state? What is it going to look like when you're there? How do you know when you win is what I always ask. So what knowledge do the people have? What skills, capability? And, and also look around at other companies. What are other companies doing differently? So I compare those, get your gaps, and then look at what you can do. So traditionally, um, businesses do things like on the left-hand side there. They um, align the business requirements. You look at your main issues and problems. You do some benchmarking, get some tools and analyze the processes and, and the, the activities going on, define your gaps and set up plans to close, right? That's what you wanna do. You wanna say, how am I gonna close these gaps? You need to set some metrics because it's always important to measure the progress and then be able to monitor and report out. So before I started my business Purple Link, I worked for large corporations. And early in my career, managers were managers and they managed a lot of the time. As I advanced in my career, and most managers I know, as well as myself, became what I, we call working managers. We're tasked with overseeing a team of, of employees. But as managers, we also had projects and assignments of our own to complete. When I started working, organizations had more administrative help and clerical help, but budget cuts and improved technology made those, that model really obsolete. So managers have less time today to spend on and with their employees. Even with this extra work piled on, it's still a manager's job to develop their team. And the traditional approach was it's up to the manager to figure that out. One thing they could do is hire consultants. I've worked with lots of teams of consultants that were hired by my employer. They usually came in on Monday, left for home on Thursday. They worked nights and furiously in between. They had stacks of paper, reports, spreadsheets, did a, did a ton of interviews, 
And then they made a grand presentation on improvements and they usually left a pile of papers behind. And for my client who was, for their client who was my employer. So they had all of these things and they said, here's what you need to do. And then they left and nothing much changed or maybe it changed for a while. And there was some efforts made to do that and a few things stuck. But for the most part, these grandiose projects in my experience have not been what really worked and changed everything. They didn't change whole, wholesale and they didn't change over time. People reverted back to their pre-consultant ways and their ideas, they, they, the processes didn't work because they weren't thoroughly thought out or they didn't understand the level of the skills people were, that people had in the organization. You can do, do seminars and workshops. I remember combing through emails and going, looking at websites for different kinds of training, one day, two day, they even have five day trainings, which I think is crazy because my brain can't handle that. Um, I've attended a few of these and a lot of things are very good. They spark your interest and you get excited about something, but so many times I would get back to the workspace after going to a conference or a seminar and have my list of things, and this is what I wanna get done. And then what hits you in the face is the first crisis of the day or the, the new, somebody, as you walk in the door, they say, oh, you know, how was it? And you start to tell them and their eyes start to glaze over and you say, and they say, well, that sounds great, but we can't do that here. And then they're off doing something else. So more than once my energy, when coming back that was really high, got zapped that first morning back at the office. By, the, by this cold reception or by another crisis or something. So you, you wanna be able to get that excitement and you wanna be able to sustain that. We've all been told to work smarter, not harder, which just means work more, I think. Um, it's often just a, a translation for then just put in a few more hours. And I know a lot of people during this pandemic are working way more hours than they did prior to the pandemic because it's easier to work from home and, oh, I'll just go in and do that email or I'll check that out or whatever. Um, and yet, we, so it was kind of a live with it thing before. You just work smarter, not harder. And yet managers were surprised and often disappointed when good employees would leave for what they perceived as greener pastures. So these traditional approaches really aren't working. And I wish I could tell you there's a magic bullet, but I haven't found it. Um, but I have seen significant in, uh, improvements in a lot of areas. Uh, again, uh, teams of consultants, I've seen significant <clears throat> effort, investment in those areas, and mixed reviews. Some good, some not so satisfactory results. But here's some ways you can make that. Um, ISM's conference is next week, and I'm willing to bet that at least one speaker is going to recommend a book. And people that listen to that are going to put that on their wish list, or they might actually buy it while they're listening to that pre presenter. Uh, I've done that myself with Amazon on my phone. I can, I've been in a conference and somebody talks about a book and it says, oh, that's great. I'm going to go get that. So there's a lot of sources for book recommendations. And today you can buy, rent, borrow, check them out of the library if the library in your area is is open, um, but you have to read the book. Just buying it and putting it on your shelf really doesn't do anything. So I've championed and participated in, seen clients buy books for the team, review the, read the book collectively. So every, every other um, week you read another chapter or every staff meeting you're, you're looking at another chapter and you read those collectively. You discuss them at your team meetings. You can have lunch events when you can have lunch events, or you can do virtual events now. I've seen that being done too. I've seen people give gift cards to their staff to say, go order yourself a lunch from Uber Eats or one of those places, get, get lunch. And then we're gonna talk about, we're gonna have our staff meeting. And part of the staff meeting can be talking about book. These discussions really, highlight key points and allow people to look at potential ways to apply these concepts in the book to your workplace, because that's the important part is translating it from that. There's, you, you guys are on this webinar today, you know there are tons of webinars, tens of webinars, TED Talks, YouTube videos, and tons of those are free. Um, I do webinars twice a month called Dynamic Dialogue and I put them on YouTube and I've had great feedback on those. So if you're interested in those, you can shoot me an email. Um, 
you can ask team members to choose and recommend things, but ask them to make a presentation about that. Or after you do that, make people come back and uh, share what they learned about that. Shadowing used to be a big part of things when you walked into a job, you got to spend the first couple of days sitting next to somebody who was an expert or a subject matter expert, and you they taught you how to do things. That's not done as often, and it's still a good way to teach a skill. If you know somebody who's good at a particular skill, to shadow that person or have that having somebody tag along to learn how they're doing that. Don't be afraid to start your own project. If you see an area that you'd like to make some improvements in, then volunteer for that. That's a good thing to do. Volunteering is a great thing to do. When people are looking for um, who wants to be on this team, who wants to be on this project, we've got this, uh, another group is looking for somebody to help out with this. It's a really good thing to do. Find a way to participate and contribute. It doesn't matter if you're not the subject matter expert, really just pitch in. And I guarantee you're going to learn some new things, meet somebody new, and become more visible within the organization if you actually do these kind of cross-functional activities. Another one is to look for in-house experts. This is really great with finance and contract people. You can get lawyers, you can get accountants who really understand their business. They can come in and help you teach your people about the things that they need from your people. If you're, if you, one time I had an accounting person who was very frustrated with um, some things that were going on in our department. And I said, okay, then you're coming into my staff meeting and you're gonna talk about this and tell them what you need. So they were put off at first, but eventually they did come and they said, this is the, this is the issue, this is the area, we need people who can do these things. This is what we're asking you to do. And she made it so simple and so straightforward that people said, oh, I, nobody ever told me that that's what we were supposed to do and how to do it. So we'll, we'll do that. And the problem was cleared up very, very quickly with a simple set of explanation and instruction on what to do. Um, and you'll find that everybody likes to give advice. Everybody likes to think they can help. So ask for help. It's, it's terrible to sit in an organization and feel like I can't do anything, I don't have any help, but ask. If you ask, somebody will find a way to help you. Look for all kinds of different resources. Um, and then, you know, play things out. You can work with others to practice, especially negotiation. This is a great thing to practice. If you're going to have a big negotiation, do, a, do some practice runs on that. Um, if you have a little bit of money, you know, you can do things like watch webinars that you have to pay for. You can spring for lunch when you can do that. And again, you used to not be able to do lunch at first in the pandemic. Now people figure out how to do Uber Eats. And um, there's a, a, a lot of those different organizations that will bring lunch to people. You can get local speakers, go to professional organizations. There's ISM, there's APEX, there's um, the CSCMP about logistics, there's the ASQ organization, there's the Project Management Institute. They all have people that are very happy to come and speak. Most of them don't charge anything. They do appreciate things like an Amazon gift card or something like that. You can do an hour or two presentation, a full day thing. On Zoom now, you can do that very easily. Go to your local organization, ask them for somebody who's an expert in an area. They'll probably find somebody and you'll probably get a really good speaker who can talk about that. When you can get back to the factory and do things like tours, it's really good. If you can tour a supplier or you can tour a manufacturer of parts that's analogous to what you're buying, that, bear, that helps incredibly. Don't forget about university resources and partnerships. I actually teach a, a couple of classes at a local university, California State University, and we have students who are always looking for jobs. They're looking for, for real world experience. So go to the university and ask for a class in X whatever you want something in. I teach supply chain classes and operations management classes. And we'd love to do capacity analysis for somebody, or we'd like to do a forecast and see how that really works. So there's a lot of things you can do. Ask for these professors. Again, they don't charge their free resources. You'll get people that are very, very well trained in some of the professors, and you'll get kids that are hungry and, and really anxious to do something for some college credit, and you'll get some, some good results.
skill development is on the minds of a lot of people. It's really important that you look at these things, um, look for different skills, different ways to do that. Remember, it's the responsibility of both a manager and an employee. If you're not getting help from your manager, then ask or find a mentor. Ask your manager. If you're not getting what you need, ask your manager, hey, can we talk about career development? Can we talk about opportunities for me to do this? Can I, is, is there budget for me to go to this webinar or to this seminar or to do things like look, um, try to get an ISM certification? Um, and I always say, don't just take no for the answer and don't ask vaguely, ask specifically. If you say, I'd like to get my CPSM certification, be prepared to say, this is what it's going to do for me, but this is what it's going to do for you and the company. If you need help with that, there's lots of people with those certifications that will help you. On the websites, they often have justification notes and tips for people who are trying to get that. You don't want to ask in the staff meeting in front of 10 other people, hey, do we pay for this? That's not the, the way to do it. Go to your boss and say, look, I really would like to do this, but it's going to cost this much money. That's going to be a burden on me. Can you pay for at least part of this? If I do this, it's going to get me this, and it, this is what I'm going to be able to give back to you. And because the numbers are fairly small in this whole scheme of a big corporation, I've had so many people tell me, you know, Jane, I, I did that. I went to my boss, so I had that conversation, and they said, sure, we'll pay for that. It's, it's not... It's not that hard. And if they say no, they can't, well, okay, you can live with that, right? So um, always ask, but ask specifically about what you want and be prepared to talk about the return on their investment. So, and if that's not what you're getting and your manager is not approachable, then find yourself a mentor. There are mentors in most companies. Most people can find somebody that who they respect and that they admire and just say, hey, can I, I'm, you know, like working on my career. Uh, I, I admire the position that you're in and I have aspirations to do that. Can you spend some time and talk to me? You can ask them to be a mentor and make it a more formal thing, or you can just say, hey, I'd like to bounce some ideas, or I'd like to pick your brain about how you got to where you are. And, and if you could give me some advice for how I might be able to do that over time. Again, people love to give advice. So ask for that. But it's important that after you get this training that you can actually apply it. It's very, it, it goes kind of out the window if you aren't able to actually apply it. So I have four factors here that I use for success. Reiterate, reinforce, make them relevant and responsible. You need to communicate, communicate, communicate. People need to understand what they're expected to do and people don't learn all the same way. So you have to explain, you have to train, and you have to get it so they understand it. Some people are great at reading a book. Some people are great at listening. Some people are great at actually doing. And everybody learns a little bit every way, but you really need to find what works for your, for your key people. So, and they don't all learn at the same rate. So you might have people that pick up on something very quickly and other people, it takes them a while but you need to be able to reinforce those learnings. So whatever, set up some metrics and give people the opportunity to practice, to ask questions so they really understand the importance of the changes that you're needing and the skills that they're trying to get. And then again, the responsibility is for both manager and individual, you've got to work on that together. Here's some statistics. I've got a couple things that I'm gonna just run through quickly. Um, 77% of HR practitioners say that there's change activities in their organization, but they say 85% of these same people experienced unsuccessful change initiatives over the past couple of years. So they're trying to make changes, but they're not always successful. Uh, coaching is one. Coaches are really important and getting somebody who can coach you or if you can coach somebody, that's very important. So 78% of employees and 75% of executives who were polled said they value coaching, but 24% of these companies report coaching as a fixture in the organization. So they value this, but they're not setting it up. And 22% say they believe employees have equal opportunity. So be on the lookout for that. Sometimes it's a matter of asking, can I get a coach? Can I get some extra help in this area? 
this is a chart that really shows that there's structured learning, there's learning from others, and then there's learning from experience. And most of that learning comes from applying and actually doing the things. That's where 70% of the learning comes from, is from that actual experience. So it doesn't matter if you have classes or books or whatever, you need to know how they're gonna be able to apply that to their work. There's a lot of different things you need to do to make sure you've got some specific goals. First, understand what skills you're trying to build or to add or to augment, then set some specific goals on how you can do that. Put some training plans together. And this is not a training plan that is one size fits all. Everybody has their own levels and their own um, experience and that they need to draw from and to take to the next level. If you don't have metrics, you're not tracking your progress. And then at the end of the year, when your boss says, what'd you do with that couple thousand dollars I gave you? You aren't able to show anything. And then going back and getting a couple thousand dollars more the next year isn't going to, isn't going to happen. So track your successes. There's really a better way. There's, I shared some low cost solutions with you, um, but you can't expect somebody to come in and teach it, fix it quickly. You need to really look from that bigger perspective. Remember those four R's to make sure you can reiterate, make it relevant to what they're doing, and then give them the practice to do that. If you, um, a, 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 a colleague of mine works for a company, they had a lot of training, they brought people in. They had several different sides across the world. They brought the trainers in. They did it all in the same place, all in the same, all the, not in the same place, all in the same way in every place. They found some sites did really well. Others didn't. They wanted to know why. So they went in and they looked and they found out that it really got down to the manager, the managers that went to the classes with their people that actually took that to heart, sat down with them, came up with individual plans, made sure they had opportunities to utilize that training. That's where it stuck. If the managers didn't go and didn't pay attention and just said, okay, that's great, then it didn't stick. So you really have to institutionalize what you want people to do. So if you have issues in this, I'm happy to help. Purple Link is good at helping train and develop skills. You can do a free call with me if you want to talk more about this. You can do callwithjane.com. Uh, it's free, and that'll take you right to my calendar. You can set up a half hour. And um, if you do that, you'll get the slides, and you'll get a subscription to my webinar. But if, if you do the call, if you're interested in that, set it up now. Set it up by the end of tomorrow. And then here is my the last chance you have to get the prizes. I'm going to give the prizes away. I think I have one more minute. So if you didn't send me an email, you need to send me an email right now to jane at purplelink.co and put webinar in the subject. And then I'm going to use my, I'm going to count the number of people that I have and I'm going to do, use my fancy little random number generator. And I'll give you about 30 seconds to do that and see who wants to win this book. You're going to win, you'll get the slides and anybody that sends me an email, I'll give you the slides. I see there was a, a question in the chat about that. I'll send that out. Kathy has the recording and that'll go out too. But the winner from today's raffle, you're going to get the slides. You're going to get this book, Radical Candor, which is a great book. And it will help you have those candid conversations with people. Um, and then you'll get a subscription to my uh, webinars. So let me start counting. Okay. So the winner is going to be Gladys Leibowitz. Gladys, are you still on? Can you say yes in the chat? She's still on. <laughs> she, okay. Then Gladys, you need to send me another email with an address where I can have the book shipped. And with that, I'll take questions. Um, I kind of went long today. Sorry about that, but there's a lot of information in here. Okay. Um, 
Someone wants you to uh, give the link again for call with Jane. Okay, that's pretty easy. Callwithjane.com. Okay, um, I don't see any questions in here. Um, so I think, uh, I think we're out of time anyway at this point. But um, at this point, I'd like to thank you, Jane, for a very, very comprehensive uh, presentation. And as Jane did mention, I will be posting this recording and I will be sending everybody the uh, recording link once it's posted to our YouTube channel. And at this point, I'd like to thank everybody for attending today's program and especially you, Jane, for uh, presenting today on this very, very important and timely topic. At this point, I'd like to close out today's program and wish everybody a wonderful afternoon. Thanks again, everybody. And I see George has a question. If he does, you can you can email me or whatever, and we can talk about that. Okay, I have the question, so I'll copy it and I'll send it to you, Jane, and then you can respond to George. Okay, okay. sounds Thank good. Thank you, everybody. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye, everybody.